And we're live. Welcome to tonight's Science Cafe. Dr. David Ingram, take it away. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Science Cafe, sponsored by Sigma Xi, the Science Scientific Honor Society, and the Office of the Vice President for Research. I'm David Ingram, uh, the Vice President of the local chapter of Sigma Xi, and the Chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. This week's cafe will be given by Professors Dustin Grooms, Janet Simon, and Stephen Pfeiffer from Physical Therapy on the Brain, Body, and Biomechanics of Injury Recovery. The next and final cafe of this semester will be next week, uh, Wednesday, March 24th, given by Professor Peter Harrington from Chemistry and Biochemistry on Chemotyping Natural Medicines Using Spectroscopy and Machine Learning. Science Cafe information can be found at www.ohio.edu slash science cafe. To keep up the participation of the audience, please put your questions in the chat. These will be asked during the talk by Rox. Now over to Professor Janet Simon. If I could just interrupt for one minute uh, our mistake. I just wanted to make sure that everybody does know that our guests today are from... Uh, uh, what is it? Applied Health Sciences and Wellness. Did I get that title right? Uh, from uh, Health Science and Professions. Forgive us. I think I had that wrong on the website for a little bit before I corrected it. I so my mistake. Therapy now rocks, so, so he's not, David's not wrong. Oh, well, welcome. So mixed group today. Janet, take it away. All right, thank you all uh, for attending today uh, and the kind introduction. Um, give us one second. Okay, um, so today we're going to talk about the brain, body, and biomechanics of injury. Our focus today will primarily be on the ACL and what happens when someone tears their ACL, what happens to them, kind of the rehab they go through, and the outcomes following that rehab. So the overview for today is we're going to go over what is an ACL injury, kind of the patient's journey after they sustain their ACL, the biomechanical changes after an ACL injury, cartilage differences after ACL injury, and then what we can do to augment therapy to have good outcomes following an injury. So the ACL is a small piece of tissue here uh, that connects the femur or the thigh bone to the tibia uh, or the shin bone. So it's this tiny piece of tissue right here. And this seems kind of like a small piece of tissue or ligament, but it actually is pretty important. It stabilizes your knee, so it prevents your tibia from coming forward, kind of, you know, coming out of your femur, uh, or from twisting or kind of internally or externally rotating. So it really stabilizes the knee joint. So if you don't have this little piece of tissue, your knee will generally feel really unstable when you're walking or running or doing any type of physical activity. So most ACL injuries happen in what we call this non-contact um, mechanism. And this happens from either landing from a jump or pivoting or twisting. So this first video we have here is Derek Rose um, tearing his ACL. And what we'll see here in a minute or so is how he lands on this jump. So he goes and jumps here and lands, and you'll see um, once he kind of realizes something bad happens, he kind of just falls out of the sky. So this is a really common mechanism here where he jumps, lands, and that's when he tears his ACL and he realizes something bad has happened. This is another common mechanism here. Oh, this is individual like is a rugby player, and she kind of has a twisting pivoting uh, issue. So here she goes, she plants, twists, and she falls over. So these are what we call non-contact injuries. So 70% of all ACL tears are what we call this non-contact mechanism, where they're not getting hit by a player, uh, they're not getting tackled like in football. It's, ha it's happening when they land awkwardly or something else happens to them 
um, from pivoting or planting. So some do occur in the contact mechanism, such as a direct blow to the knee, but most are for this non-contact mechanism. So ACL injuries are actually quite common. So there are about 200 ACL injuries annually in the US, but if we look at our most athletic population, our adolescent athletes, it's a little bit higher incidence rate, about one in 60 adolescents uh, will suffer an ACL injury. And we do have some sex differences as well. So females are about five to ten times, five to eight times more likely to sustain an ACL injury than males. Uh, so our female athletes are really what we want to consider when we're looking at different treatment interventions so we can have good outcomes and hopefully prevent uh, ACL injuries. And a lot of things, people speculate why this happens, why females are more likely to sustain an ACL injury, but most of the time it's due to lower extremity movement pattern differences between sexes. And all of this equates to about $3 billion a year in healthcare costs. So it is quite a burden on the healthcare system, um, ACL injuries. So once someone tears their ACL, in the US at least, uh, the standard of care is reconstruction. Uh, repair, when they actually sew the ACL back together or use some sort of tissue to try to repair the ACL is less common in the US. Uh, usually we reconstruct the ACL, so we remove all of the tissue out of uh, the remaining ACL and we reconstruct uh, the graft. And this can be done using an aloe graft, such as this is a cadaver um, and not the person's native tissue, uh, or an autograft where we use a quad tendon, a patellar tendon, or a hamstring tendon. But either way, basically what they do is they will drill a tunnel into the tibia, drill a tunnel into the femur, and reconstruct the ACL using this graft tissue, either from yourself or from a donor. So after rehab, what happens to this person is they develop this really swollen, painful knee. And we can see that here as this individual has torn their ACL. You can see their incision, their um, sutures here from where they went in and did the surgery. So we have made a ton of advances in surgery from a really long time ago. They used to have to do this in an open pr procedure where you'd have a huge scar in your knee. Now we do it um, just through these tiny little holes here. But you can see this patient has a lot of swelling. Uh, they have very little definition in their knee and their quadriceps. So they have a lot of quadriceps inhibition here uh, due to that swelling. So this individual, here has a lot of pain, swelling, weakness, difficulties balancing, doing really any physical activity. So that's why they go through this really extensive rehabilitation. And what this rehabilitation will look like is we'll brace the knee to make sure we kind of make sure the graft can heal properly. So we don't want them falling or doing any twisting. Uh, so this brace really limits that. They'll go on crutches. Then we'll start with some range of motion exercises uh, because all of that swelling in the knee will really limit the range of motion and it's really key to get that range of motion back. Then they'll start with some strengthening, some balance exercises, moving on to more sport specific exercises, and then eventually returning to their sport or activity if they wish. So how does it decided when someone returns to play is usually this is by time. A lot of our decisions are just based on time to uh, return to play, how they're doing in their rehab. Uh, and this is commonly six to 12 months um, after their ACL injury, individuals will return to play. Janet, when you have a chance, you have your first question. Sure. So the first question, is there a difference in the predicted outcomes based on the type of graft that somebody receives? Either. Yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, so a lot of times the type of graft choice is usually dependent on the patient as well, uh, how old they are, what their goal is for returning to level of activity. If you're a young, healthy person and you want to return to high level activity, 
Um, most people will use a patellar tendon or a hamstring graft. Um, someone who might be older, uh, not looking to return to activity, they might use a different graft such as a cadaver. A lot of people, if they have a second tear to their ACL, they will um, use a cadaver graft as well. The outcomes, I would say, is mixed. Um, a lot of times there's really no different outcomes in different graft or pair when you're looking at individual like age levels, it's really the age levels where it starts to become a little bit different um, and what your level of activity that you want to return to. Thank you. So even after these people return to their activity, so the research is showing that they've gone through this extensive rehabilitation, six months, eight months, 10 months, et cetera, individuals will still have residual muscle imbalances or weakness. They will also have complaints of pain, instability, or fear of movement. A lot of people after they have this surgery will just say, my knee doesn't feel right. I'm scared to run, I'm scared to cut. So this is a real problem with our rehabilitation because we're not really fixing the deficits completely that these individuals have. And what do these long-term outcomes look like? So if someone tears their ACL, about 50% of individuals will develop knee osteoarthritis within 10 years after their reconstruction. So if you're 16 years old and you've torn your ACL, it's like the prime age for when you tear your ACL around that age, uh, you are going to most, you know, a large percentage of those individuals will have osteoarthritis by the time they're 26. And this is very concerning because that's a young person still that has osteoarthritis that may eventually need a knee replacement. So this injury can really have a lot of long-term consequences uh, that someone might not think about when they're a young um, child playing sports or athletics. Also, there's an increased risk of sustaining a secondary ACL injury. So you're about a five to 10 times higher chance of um, having a second ACL injury, and this is either to the same leg, so you can re-tear your, you can tear your graft, or you can tear the other leg, uh, that ACL. And about 30%, 29 to 30% of individuals will have a second ACL tear, either to the graft or their other leg. So all of this is really troubling because with every subsequent ACL tear, you have this long-term and short-term disability, and this really burdens our healthcare system. So these are the next steps that we're going to talk about and where I'm going to kind of turn it over to my other co-presenters is we have this traditional return to play approach here where it's really based on time, it's very knee specific, and it's really based on this arbitrary decision. It's a very narrow view of when someone's ready to return to play based on a physician saying yes or no, you can return to your activity with no limitations. So what we're really trying to do in our lab is really to define an optimized return to play approach. So we want it to be more criterion based instead of time based. So they have to pass some sort of metrics uh, before they return to play. It's multifactorial, um, meaning that we incorporate different modalities in the rehabilitation. We incorporate the sensory motor spectrum. So our nerves, our brain, our nerves innervate all of our surrounding muscles. So we can't ignore that. That's what moves us throughout the day. So we need to make sure that we're incorporating the brain into our rehabilitation. It needs to be multi-segmental. Again, we can't be knee focused. We need to be whole body focused. We need to, in we need to incorporate the individual, the tasks that they're doing and the environment. If we think back to the videos that we saw when an individual tore their ACL, they were usually doing something else. They were catching a pass or they were changing direction. And a lot of our rehabilitation occurs statically like in a clinic with no surrounding distractions, but sport isn't done that way. So we need to make sure we're incorporating the environment into our rehabilitation as well. And return to play is a continuum. It's not just a arbitrary, yes, you're ready to return to play. You usually need some follow-up care. So making sure our rehabilitation um, continues with them after they return to play, quote unquote, and work on prevention as well, that second risk for injury. And this is a shared decision-making process. You need to make sure that you're incorporating your athletes in the decision-making process of you know, their return to play decision, the physicians, everyone is involved in that. So kind of the key here is the knee is not simply bones, muscle, and connective tissue. 
we need to treat the whole person. This is a person who has a knee problem and not necessarily solely a knee. So the next part of this presentation will kind of talk about incorporating what I've talked about here in this optimized return to play approach is using biomechanics, using ultrasound or imaging to look at osteoarthritis, and then or incorporating the sensory motor system into our rehabilitation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Pfeiffer, who's gonna talk about biomechanics and osteoarthritis. And then Dr. Grooms will talk about incorporating the sensory motor system into rehabilitation and the relationship between the brain and biomechanics. Well, thank you, Dr. Simon, as I take control of the presentation here. Uh, Dr. Grimms, I believe I'm having a little bit of issue taking control. I tell you what, while we're waiting, Janet, you do have a question which uh, might actually be uh, discussed later, but the person wants to know, so how many ACL reconstructions actually result in knee replacements? I don't know if we know that exactly. I, I'm not sure if we have the literature on that. It's an interesting question. We certainly know that the long-term outcomes are not amazing once you tear your ACL, a large percent percentage will have OA. We do have things where we can have a lot of interventions um, to help treat OA, such as activity is actually really good for knee osteoarthritis. A lot of people think like, oh, once I have osteoarthritis, I shouldn't do activity. And that's contrary. Uh, a lot of the research shows that uh, the physical activity interventions, those people actually have the best outcomes. So I don't know if we know necessarily how many will go on to get a knee replacement, but it is certainly the sequelae of ACL tear osteoarthritis. If you don't treat your osteoarthritis and continue with low level physical activity, um, you know, you will eventually need a knee replacement and potentially a revision. Um, and that's when it kind of snowballs. So uh, I don't know that answer exactly. Maybe one of my colleagues might know. Thank you. So my what, what I'm going to speak to everyone about today is the role that biomechanics plays in this process of viewing the patient as a whole uh, from top to bottom, basically. And we're going to focus a lot on um, this using this model of an ACL injury and the risk of osteoarthritis and secondary injury um, following the initial injury that we see. But we're really going to talk about the role that biomechanics plays, what kind of alterations we see, and how that can actually influence things like cartilage health within your knee joint and why that's so pivotal in terms of the development of knee osteoarthritis. So from a very basic perspective, biomechanics is defined as the study of mechanical laws relating to the movement or structure of living organisms. But in simpler terms and in the context of this discussion, Biomechanics refers to the physics of how an individual moves. It examines the forces that are generated by the human body during movement, but also the forces that are placed on the human body during movement as well. In your everyday life, you probably consider biomechanical concepts and ideas without even knowing it. Whether you may be lifting something heavy from the ground and have said or have been told to, quote, lift with your legs or have watched a sporting event and thought an athlete's form was off, Biomechanics are highly important and are highly influential within our world. And so what you all may not know is how this traumatic injury, this ACL injury, can drastically alter how a person uh, moves even after going through this full healing and rehabilitation process, as well as what these long-term effects are. So within the neuromuscular biomechanics and health assessment lab here at Ohio University, this is one of the foundational ideas that we as a group are interested in exploring. So utilizing three-dimensional motion capture technology, we are able to assess the biomechanical changes that take place following the, this ACL injury. As you're able to see in the video that's playing, three-dimensional motion capture utilizes these retroreflective markers that are placed on specific landmarks on the body. How the system works is that each of these markers is tracked by the cameras that surround this motion capture area. 
So as a whole, all of these markers are tracked on the same individual. And then what we're able to do is take all of these markers and create a skeletal model that is unique to each individual based on their anatomy. The skeletal model then allows us to examine specific variables, such as knee flexion angle, which corresponds to how far someone's knee bends when they walk. We're able to calculate this by looking at how much the lower leg segment of of this individual moves in relation to their thigh. Additionally, we incorporate the use of in-ground force plates with the three-dimensional motion capture system to get this full biomechanical profile of each patient that comes through our laboratory. As humans, every time that we take a step onto a surface, that surface provides a force that is equal and opposite onto us. And because this happens, every time you step into the ground, the ground places a force on your body that prevents you from literally falling into the earth. This variable is called a ground reaction force, and it's measured and is a measure of, of the overall force that is placed on the body as an individual lands on the ground. And so the use of these force plates to measure these variables, such as ground reaction force, along with the use of three-dimensional motion capture, complete this biomechanical profile that we're looking to create for each of the people that comes through our lab. Osteoarthritis as a whole, um, osteoarthritis, uh, excuse me. So osteoarthritis as a whole affects over 30 million uh, individuals in the United States alone. And if we get that to the specific osteoarthritis, is knee osteoarthritis is the 11th leading cause of global disability. Now, what's troubling about this disease as a whole is that if you look at this figure on the right here, we're able to see that um, from a period from 1996 to 2015, the number of individuals that were being treated for knee osteoarthritis actually doubled. And so with this, these individuals experience things such as increased pain, decreased physical activity, and even something as serious as increased mortality as well. Now, if relating this back to the ACL injury, when, you, when an individual develops knee osteoarthritis following an ACL injury, this is actually classified as something called orthopedic knee osteoarthritis. It is a specific type of osteoarthritis. They're different. And this actually accounts for about 12 of symptomatic individuals with osteoarthritis. And so if we take this number out, this is approximately about 5 million individuals in the United States. And what Dr. Simon pointed out in such a good way was that these injuries take place in individuals that are young. Typically, this age range is around 16 to 24 years old. What you have is you have individuals that develop disability much earlier in life, and it leads to an increase in the number of years that they actually live with that disability. So to the question earlier about how many ACL injuries result in a knee replacement, while that answer is difficult for us to, to determine specifically, what we know is that when this ACL injury happens, that's leading to a lot, a greater proportion of our population that is living with this debilitating disease at a very earlier age, and that increases this number of years that they live with that disability. Now, the reason that we're so focused on this slide on articular cartilage is that articular cartilage a decline in that health is a hallmark sign of knee osteoarthritis. So articular cartilage is a tissue that covers our uh, synovial joints within our body, such as our knee. And cartilage is made up of something called an extracellular matrix, which if you, if you look at what this picture shows on the right, cartilage is made up of water and then macromolecules within the cartilage. And what those macromolecules do is it creates an architecture where cartilage is allowed to enable to help with the transmission of force through a joint, such that every time we take a step somewhere and we land, our bones don't come into contact directly with each other. That cartilage allows it to absorb some of that force. And the idea here of an example for you all to think about is the, the example of a waterbed. If you ever lay on a waterbed, you don't sink all the way through, but the waterbed itself does sink and portions of it rise. So with cartilage, when we have cartilage that is compressed when we walk or when we land, that cartilage will actually compress in certain areas and there will be fluid shifts. 
And so what happens with osteoarthritis is this architecture within the cartilage itself actually breaks down and it's not able to withstand that loading as much. So when thinking about biomechanics and how it relates to knee osteoarthritis, this diagram does a really good job of explaining how in this top figure here, we have a change in ambulation or movement that takes place for any number of reasons. It could be something as simple as weight gain could, li could lead to this. We know that obesity is a very high risk for developing knee osteoarthritis. When something that like that happens, that changes the way that the muscles around our joint actually activate and changes the way that our joint is loaded. When that happens, we have a change in the way that our cartilage is loaded. Now, it's important to note that cartilage actually absorbs loading in a very regulated way, meaning that it becomes, a, it becomes accustomed to the way that it is loaded. So when there is any kind of alteration that takes place, it will alter the way that the cartilage is stressed and the strain that is placed on that. What that then does is lead to a biological response that could increase inflammation, for example. And this biological response has actually been shown to be strong enough such that that biological response can continue to alter the way that we move. So we have this vicious circle, this vicious cycle of how alterations in our mechanics can actually elicit this process to begin, and it's hard for us to intervene on that. And if we move towards, again, back to post-traumatic osteoarthritis following this knee injury, it's very similar, except that with this, we actually have an inciting event. Typically with osteoarthritis, we don't know when it begins. It begins without an incident. But with post-traumatic osteoarthritis, we know that the injury occurs and what we see with post-traumatic osteoarthritis is, is it's actually this triangular shape where we could have an alteration in biomechanics that leads to an alteration in biology that can change the structure of the joint. And that's how the arthritis develops so quickly at such an accelerated rate. And so what we think about in relation to this diagram is where do we intervene for our patient? Where do we develop these better strategies? And so that's where we come to this idea of intervening on biomechanics. As a biomechanist, I know that biomechanics are modifiable, and so I can target specific variables such as ground reaction force that I mentioned earlier and try and adjust that to what I believe would be optimal for my patient. So following an ACL injury, what we see is we see very common alterations in an individual's walking biomechanics. As Dr. Simon mentioned, we see muscle weakness and inhibition, specifically in the quadriceps, for our individuals with an ACL reconstruction. And those are the muscles that are on the front of our thigh. The reason that this is such a big deal is that these muscles are responsible for helping us attenuate force when we walk. So when you land, your quadriceps are controlling how you absorb that energy when you walk. So with specific variables like ground reaction force, we have actually seen that individuals actually respond with a change in their ground reaction force, meaning that they overload or they underload compared to what they did previously following an ACL reconstruction. And there's a lot that goes into why that may take place. But something else that we see is that these individuals demonstrate what we call a stiff-legged gait, where they actually walk with their knees more extended and they go through less movement as they walk. And this can be troublesome because again, getting back to this idea of how, how post-traumatic osteoarthritis comes about, is that an alteration in mechanics occur and that can directly influence our cartilage. So one of the things that we need to be able to do and that we are focused on in our laboratory is assessing changes that take place within the joint. And one of the ways that we do that is a novel technique using ultrasound. So ultrasound has been used in a myriad of factors. It's used in a wide range in the medical community. But what we use it for is to actually get a measure of our articular cartilage in our knee. So what we actually can do is we can have an individual bend their knee to a certain degree. We are able to visualize what their cartilage looks like. And then we can do things like have them walk on a treadmill for 30 minutes to compress their cartilage over and over and over, and then we assess how that cartilage actually changes. And so what we see a lot in this is we've seen that cartilage gets thinner through a lot of walking, but at certain times, cartilage will actually get thicker as well. 
It's almost a protective mechanism such that if your cartilage gets too thin, your body actually will regulate that response. So what we know is that as early as three months or six months following an ACL reconstruction, we can already see changes in the cartilage. And we've been able to look at some of that using ultrasound, but we use other imaging modalities such as MRI. It's just ultrasound is much easier to use in a clinical setting, in a more regular setting. And so by using ultrasound, we're able to look at how does the cartilage change and how is it different from someone that is healthy and doesn't have an injury. And when we're able to detect these early changes, what we're actually able to do is then take that and develop interventions to say, okay, I'm going to try and elicit a change in the cartilage, something that I think is optimal to try and protect it from getting too thin or from the health declining. And so what we can then do is we can measure using ultrasound how our interventions work. Eben, you have a question, and it, it has to do with what you're talking about now. So the question is, um, <clears throat> after an injury, bones can heal. And the question is, does cartilage heal, or is it basically that once it's injured, it's going downhill, or you're just trying to preserve the function that's left? That's a great question. And so the, the short answer is that cartilage does not have the ability to heal itself. So what we do see is that obviously the statistic that Dr. Simon presented was not if you tear your ACL, 100% of individuals are going to have osteoarthritis. We just know that the injury itself and then the potential mechanical alterations that we see in someone's biomechanics when you have an injury to the cartilage and then you have someone that moves and places force on that cartilage in an altered way, then what we know is that that could potentially speed up the process. So it doesn't heal itself. And that's what makes it such a difficult tissue to actually try and uh, prevent any disease from coming into or to heal itself. There's lots of um, uh, pharmaceutical and pharmacological interventions that are being looked at to look at the biology of cartilage. A lot of people are working at it from a very cellular perspective. But the way that we look at it is that we know that the cartilage is going to be at greater risk for this disease. So could the progression towards that disease be caused by the alterations in how someone moves? So I've talked a lot about osteoarthritis, but the other part of this that Dr. Simon mentioned was the secondary ACL injury risk where if someone tears their ACL, they're five to 10 times more likely to re-tear it compared to someone sustaining their initial injury. And that 29% of these individuals go on to actually have a re-tear. And so we know that there are risk factors that take place and that are biomechanical risk factors that are multiplanar in, na in nature. So I'm gonna move to a different video and discuss these uh, very briefly. But what we know is that um, when an individual per performs a movement, such as what you're going to see here on the screen, which is called a jump landing or a drop landing, what we see is that these individuals, these dynamic movements produce more force through the knee joint at much higher volumes than what you would have with walking. So in other words, it's difficult for someone, it would be difficult for someone to re-tear their, their ACL by walking. Typically, it would happen through this dynamic kind of movement. And so some of these risk factors that we see is that individuals with an ACL reconstruction will actually, they'll have greater bend inward of their knees, which is called increased valgus or knee valgus. And that places a lot of stress on these individuals. Um, we see that individuals actually do land with stiffer leg uh, motions as well, where there's not as much bend in their knee, and that could lead to kind of this, uh, this reduction in their ability to absorb that force. And anytime we have greater amount of force that goes through the knee joint, there's the potential for the ACL to actually sustain that injury because of that higher amount of force. And what we've actually found recently is that the way someone lands actually does have a relationship to their cartilage health. So as a lab, we're interested in looking at how improving how someone lands, not only to try and prevent the way that, or prevent any kind of alteration 
in their loading such that they may re-injure themselves, but to hopefully aim at preserving their long-term joint health. So this has all been very focused on the biomechanics and how that relates specifically to the body, but I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Grooms now, and he's going to talk about some of the innovative techniques that we have looking at the way of using uh, next generation types of rehabilitation techniques to focus on the sensory motor uh, complex that Dr. Simon spoke about. All right, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Janet. That was a great introduction. Now I get to kind of uh, build on that and hopefully have uh, talk about more of what we do in the clinic and some of the things we've been working on over the last five, six years now at Ohio University. So what Stephen was just talking about up top here, this is our biomechanics lab, and this is what we measure most of the time in our field. We measure movement. The problem with this is, though, is you can generate all of these movements with a variety of neural strategies. And it wasn't up until the last 20 or 30 years where we had really good technologies that could help us measure those neural strategies in living humans. So we had a lot of great basic science techniques, but if we wanted you to be alive after the experiment, we didn't really have a lot of good ways to do it up until a lot of breakthroughs over the last 30 years, primarily related to neuroimaging. So what you're seeing on the bottom row is our 3T research grade MRI that's in collaboration with the local Holzer Health healthcare system. We're very fortunate that in Athens, there's only a handful of 3T MRIs and we just happen to be very lucky to be located right next door to one here in Athens. And so we're able to collect these sort of fantastic um, brain imaging data, understand how the brain is activating, how its function is changing, and even how its very structure changes with these injuries and some of the new interventions we've been trying. Before I jump into how the brain is changing with ACL injury and how our new therapies may be able to change it back or maybe even to augment some of how the brain generates movement, it's first a good to understand how does the nervous system even generate movement to begin with? And so normally we think of the brain as these segmented regions. So we have our primary motor cortex and our premotor cortex. And a lot of times we would think, well, these are the regions that do all your movement for you. But really, your brain takes in information from everywhere. And so when you go to generate movement, you're pulling information from your visual cortex, from your auditory cortex, from your frontal cortex, your thinking cortex and executive control. And all of that information comes to your premotor area. And this area is what allows you to do a lot of motor planning and think about what you're going to do next. And then it goes down to the muscles from your primary motor cortex. This step here, though, is extremely important. And based on injuries or training, you can drastically change how this step is completed, how the brain organizes to generate the required neural activity to allow you to move and interact with the world. So like I mentioned before, we use primarily neuroimaging in our lab, and I know I made it sound very fantastic on the first slide, but we end up doing pretty simple movements. And so we're looking at the height of sensory motor neuroscience right here. And, um, and the reason for this limitation is you're looking at this, you may think, well, that's not that interesting. They're just kicking their knee. Who cares? It's because if your head moves a half of a millimeter, so if you think of a centimeter is about the width of your pinky, and so you're looking at a tenth of that and then half of that tenth. So extremely small amount of movement. If your head moves that much, then we can't use the data. And so over the last few years, we've had a lot of breakthroughs where we now are able to do leg press movements and do more complex movements. But this was our first experiment. And this took about a year to get working. And so everything in science is a little bit slower than we would like. But nonetheless, when we look at this very simple movement, we look at how the brain is activating. What I'm gonna show you on the next image is how an ACL patient activates their brain to do this very simple task in red, and then in blue is a healthy control. And so I'll let this play a few times and sort of walk you through it. The reason why the image looks a little grainy is that this is raw fMRI data coming off the scanner. So we have to collect it very, very fast. And then some of the images I'll show you later, they'll look very crisp, very clean, and very nice. And that's because we register or we take this data and we put it on a very high resolution image. But I wanted to give you an idea of, the, of the, what the data sort of looks like when we're collecting it in this very rapid sense during the motor task. So if you've torn your ACL to execute that task, your brain activates in red, 
But if you're a matched healthy control, your brain activates in blue. And this is just the data for a single person, an ACL person, and then their matched control person. And what you'll notice is there's just a lot more red than there is blue. So I remember doing this experiment many years ago now, and I was shocked at the level of red versus blue. You would think that it would be relatively similar, or I would see some minute differences, and I was just blown away at how much more regions of the brain and how much higher the neural activity was in these patients with ACL injuries, even though my in this first study, all of our patients were six months from the injury at least, and they were done with their therapy, they were back to doing whatever they wanted to do, and their brain still activated like this. And so this led us to a lot of questions and, a, and sort of this journey that I'm gonna take you on over the next few slides. The two key things to take from this is that you'll notice that the ACLs activate a lot more of their sensory motor cortex. They activate a lot of their visual cortex here in the back. And then now as we're coming from back to front in the brain, you'll see the ACLs will activate a lot more of the front parts of their brain. And I'll go over those two key differences here so that you see all the front parts. And so what we think is happening is normally we generate, we could think of generating movement in this sort of linear path. You have it, sensory information comes in here in your parietal cortex, sort of in the middle back part of your brain. This is your proprioceptive area. So those of you who don't know proprioception is the ability to know where your joints are in space. So if I close my eyes here and I can touch my fingertips together, you'd be like, how did you do that? Well, I couldn't see my finger, so how could I possibly have done that? So you do it through your sense of proprioception, all of your ligaments, your skin, your muscles, they give you the nerve system information where your joints are in space, and all that information gets processed here. Then it goes through the thalamus and your frontal cortex, and then to the motor planning, and then to the motor cortex and down to your muscles. But if you get an injury, we've messed up that information coming into the sensory cortex. So that proprioceptive sense is damaged. And what we're seeing is that the brain starts to rewire and it starts to change how it's going to generate movement. And it pulls it from a few areas. One area is it pulls it from your visual cortex. So if you've lost this sensory ability, or this proprioceptive ability, you try to make up for it by using vision to program motion now. And that's what helps you keep the output to your muscles. And then we've recently shown with some more data, Cody Chris, who has uh, just defended his PhD, this was part of his work. He did a really great study where we looked at the how is the brain communicating? How are all the different regions talking to each other? And he showed at first while we see the shift towards increased visual region activity to control the knee joint, they, oh, all those regions, they communicate with all the regions in the front of your brain. And all those regions, they control your attention and what you're thinking about, and they control processing in the world. And so what we see is you get this injury, this little loss of proprioception, results in this massive cascade of neural changes where now you start to use a lot more vision and a lot more focused attention to control your knee, even for these simple knee motor tasks, which we think can have big implications if you want to go back to complex sport. And some of our um, more recent data, we've taken advantage of breakthroughs in structural brain imaging. And this is just a fantastic uh, video. Um, this is, was collected on an experimental seven Tesla MRI in Germany, and at the end it has some CGI artist rendering. But what this technology does, it maps the water diffusion, or how the water molecules move within the brain, and water molecules will move along myelin, or along axons, or along the connections. And then we're able to compute what is the direction of neural communication everywhere in the brain. So this is a truly fantastic technology. That's what you're seeing at the end is an artist render of the water diffusing along all of the different tracks. And the colors are all there for direction. So red is left to right, blue's up and down, and green is forward and back. Sometimes I did this in my class once, and the students thought your brain was colored. And so I have to remind you that the brain is not actually colored. We add these later so we can better um, map the directions that all of your neurons and axons are traveling. And so we take advantage of this technology. We ask this question, well, does the brain structurally change after this orthopedic injury? We found indeed it does. If we look at the motor cortex of the ACL patients, and we ask this question, what all is structurally connected to that motor cortex? So the motor cortex is right here, where my cursor is. Hopefully um, everyone can see it. But anyway, it's at the very top of the brain. 
And as you can see, the ACL patients, they have a lot more orange than the control patients on both hemispheres of the brain. So it's as if once you get that knee injury and it's lost the proprioception that, it, that the brain expects, it starts to send structural connections out to other regions in the brain to try to augment the information coming to the motor cortex to allow it to program motion and still engage with the world. However, we don't, we're not supposed to use movement, or sorry, use vision and attention to control your knee joint. You're supposed to use it to interact with the world. This is a great research study where they looked at eye tracking as people just hiked at a normal pace, so they're just walking. So when I play the video, what you're going to see is this is their instrumented body, so we can look at how the, all the joints are moving. This purple arrow is what they're looking at. And then over here is the eye tracking, and this little crosshair is what this person is staring at all the time. And then down here is all the data coming in, but you can really just look at these two videos up here and get a sense for what is happening. What I want you to draw your attention to is very rarely does this person look at their foot or almost never looks at their knee. You use vision to program about two steps ahead. And you do it naturally without even thinking about it. The only time you bring visual attention back to you is when you make an error or something's extremely complicated or you're about to hit something. Most of the time you're using it to program far ahead of yourself. That way you can navigate the world and not hit things and be on the lookout for things. But I've just talked about that after these injuries, we start to use that visual attention just to control your knee joint. And then we think about going back to sport. That is very taxing on visual attention, but we've done all this rehabilitation and we've lost this proprioception where we've allowed this potential visual attention compensation to manifest. And then it's no wonder when people go back to sport and they can't focus on their joint that they get re-injured. Which brings us to what can we do about it? So if we have this problem, we have high re-injury rates, as Dr. Simon and Dr. Pfeiffer talked about, what can we do in our rehabilitation? So we spent the last several years trying to design what this augmented rehabilitation might look like. And I'm gonna share with you a few of our interventions over these next few slides. One thing we've taken a lot of advantage of is virtual reality. So this is in our lab. And what you'll see on the back monitor is what the uh, patient is visualizing or seeing in the heads-up display. And so we try to use virtual reality a lot for a, a lot of different therapies because it allows us to manipulate the environment and manipulate the visual attention to be whatever we want. And so what you're seeing here is she's getting a mismatch in the visual information versus her proprioceptive information. She thinks she's stable proprioceptive-wise, but visual-wise, it looks like she's moving through an environment. And this disconnect, we think, can allow us to train that neural pathway that is compensating and potentially setting up for them for re-injury later when they go back to sport. We've also used roller coasters to induce um, this perturbation and in visual information versus sensory information. And we find the use of virtual reality to be very powerful. It's much more powerful than just closing one's eyes and trying to do training. We've also done very much more basic exercises where we do first person views of someone kicking a ball or whatever your sport is. So you're boring exercises that you normally do in physical therapy. We try to augment them with virtual reality. This has a really cool effect because we get what's called mirror neuron activity. And so mirror neurons, it's just a very fantastic scientific story how they were discovered. Um, it was about 1988, and it was an Italian neurophysiologist, I always mispronounce it, Rosolate, Rosolate, in his lab, and it was, they were found entirely by accident. So this is just amazing scientific discovery. His um, postdoc is in the lab, and they have a, a primate or a monkey instrumented with a, an electrode in the brain and the motor cortex. And they're going to study reaching, so they're trying to train this monkey to reach for a banana. And the student prepares the experiment early, and then the student reaches for the banana to set it up, but the electrode is in, and the, elect and the electrode sensed neural activity in the motor cortex, and everyone just froze, because that should be impossible. The monkey just saw a movement, and the motor cortex activated as if it was moving, but the monkey didn't move at all. And then they reproduced the experiments, and it's just a, a fantastic story of uh, accidental, but a great scientific discovery. What that means is, if you just see movement, in this case, the young lady seeing a soccer kick, a portion of the motor cortex that actually would activate to kick the ball will activate. So we can take advantage of this to try to train the neural strategies of more advanced sport movements before they can even lift their legs. 
We've also used it to try to train sport reactions. So this was a study by a master's student where he used a VR camera on, with our football team and he trained them to change leg that they were standing on and sort of avoid this virtual defender coming at them. So this was getting them to train rapid decision making and, and avoidance of a collision. And we've also did a, another master's student did a study where he looked at um, what if we trick people so we have this visual sensory mismatch. So let's trick them and make them think they're on top of skyscrapers, then have them do the drop landing that Steve showed you. And we found this was particularly um, disturbing to people's biomechanics, especially if they had um, history of injury. It may allow us to detect those who are at injury risk before they play their sport and maybe should do some extra training. And then finally, um, in a collaborative project with Cincinnati Children's Hospital, we've developed a sport virtual reality where we bring sport into our lab and we see how people move when we really challenge them with all the visual demands of sport. And then this is a, a really exciting technology we've been working on for a few years. Again, with um, um, with this is now there. Are, excuse me, sorry. Now they're at Emory Healthcare. They were at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. This group is the same group from the last VR simulation. And this is a tool that tries to train you to move without you actually understanding how it works. So I'll let the video play. This takes advantage of augmented reality to train you to have good, low injury risk movement patterns without you even realizing it. Augmented neuromuscular training, or ANIMATE, is a new state-of-the-art method for training athletes to reduce the risk of injury. The genesis of ANIMATE comes from a combination of the most advanced technological and scientific innovations. ANIMATE uses motion capture sensors to create a three-dimensional model of the athlete. As the athlete performs specific exercises, our proprietary algorithms work in real time to synthesize hundreds of thousands of data points and transform the data to analyze biomechanical risk factors associated with injury. Animate uses the transformed data to create a simple visual biofeedback representation of the athlete's movements, displayed in an augmented reality headset worn by the athletes. The biofeedback takes the form of a simple geometric shape, which acts as a guide to avoid high-risk biomechanics. This style of simplified biofeedback enhances learning and improvement of movement skills. The athlete is instructed to control the shape through their movements and keep the shape as close to a perfect rectangle as possible. The rectangular goal shape represents movements and biomechanics associated with low injury risk and optimized performance. So in working with this group, we've been looking at how or what are the brain adaptations when you do this sort of training. And what we find is that you get a very advantageous neural activation strategy that reduces the use of reliance on attention and visual processing. And it actually improves efficiency or the, the level of neural activity you need of your motor cortex in order to generate knee movements. But the classic way we used to give feedback would just be like, keep your knees over your toes, keep your head up bend at the waist more, bend at your knee more, we find that does the exact opposite. It makes your border cortex less efficient and it makes you really rely on vision and attention for movement. So this is a way we're sort of tricking people into moving how we want them to with a good neural strategy and hope it looks to be very promising. So Dustin, you have a question and it, it's going back a little bit, but the, the question is, is, you know, so there is a difference between your control, your match control patient and your ACL patient, but what happens to that ACL patient over time? Do you see that their brain activity returns to normal or not? That's a great question. And that's actually the objective of one of our ongoing studies right now. We're tracking people after they get out of uh, Dr. Sergiola's office here at Ohio Health. They come into our lab and we get them after the surgery all the way up six months to nine months when they go back to sport. So I'll have an answer for that soon. But I will say in our studies right now, the people that were furthest away from injury, they had the most brain structural changes on that diffusion imaging I showed. So it looks mm -hmm. like time is not really going to resolve these issues. It looks like they may even become ingrained. And then you lay down more myelin in the pathways that really rely on cognition and vision for motor control. So I would say um, they don't go back to normal. So in the data that we have available. Okay. One other related question is if you can predict a certain percentage of athletes will 
have an ACL issue, can you actually do the study on enough pre-ACL people that when they finally, a few in that group finally have the ACL, that you have a baseline for those individuals, which is something that you normally wouldn't have. Has anybody ever done that? So the study with the augmented reality, that's actually enrolling about 480 um, high-risk pediatric females to answer that question. Like if we intervene, so we get their baseline, some get the intervention, some are controls, and we get their brain imaging as well as their movement profile before their seasons. And the hope is that that will be powered up to answer questions like that. Thank but you. But you're right, there's extremely difficult. Perspective data is uh, always wins and it's always hard to get. Mm -hmm. All right, this is actually my last slide, our last um, thing, one thing we wanted to share today and then we can, we can field some more questions. So this tool is one that's much, it's a little less, ex, a lot less expensive and much easier to use. It's just simple stroboscopic glasses. And what they do, they allow us to perturbate the level of visual feedback someone is getting during movement. So these glasses, we can customize the frame rate that they shutter and you can have low removal or high removal of visual feedback. Before I play the first person view, it's very important if you have a history of epilepsy or seizures or anything, do not um, watch the next video that'll show up. And so this just shows you what it's like from the first person perspective in a moment. And a lot of times in our lab, we'll train people or in the clinic to do different reactive drills or different things that require visual attention. And what we're seeing so far, um, thanks to the work of a doctoral student, uh, Meredith Chapu, and then uh, an HTC student, Tim Wool, is that um, they've identified that with this type of training, we're able to target a specific sensory visual pathway in the brain that is altered in our ACL patients. So it looks like this intervention will be promising to try to target the neural changes we see. And this is something that's a few hundred dollars and you can add it to most general physical therapy or athletic training interventions. All right, so thank you uh, everyone for going on this journey with us through our lab. Uh, hopefully everyone got a good experience and uh, I'd like to thank Bernadine who was our patient throughout all of this. She's our project manager research associate. She's an exceptional model. And uh, this is uh, some of the students we've had and our current students. Uh, thank you for your attention. So I do have a question. Um, what are some of the typical obstacles to recovery? Uh, and it sounds like they're trying to get at both physical as well as maybe emotional and mental obstacles. That is a good, uh, so we could probably talk about that for a very long time. Um, so physical, like mental obstacles, we're seeing a lot of fear of re-injury or what's called kinesiophobia or fear of movement. So about 20% to 25% of our patients will have this issue. And it does seem to be, um, Ho Wan Kim actually is working on that exact problem, trying to figure out what is the neural manifestation of that and how is it different from what's just generally going on and does being have high fear or mental uh, issue perhaps exaggerate some of these effects that we're seeing. And then a lot of barriers for us is just a lot of times patients don't get enough rehabilitation and they don't get enough exposure. And then how our clinicians do it, as most people know, it takes a very long time to change medical education. So by the time all these breakthroughs that we have, um, you're looking at several years at best before it gets out into the clinical world, if not longer. So that is also always a barrier. I don't know if my co-presenters want to add to that. So for an average ACL injury, the person wants to know, what is the average time to recovery? And recovery being defined as return to sport, but also to when they feel quote unquote normal again. So I would say you probably never feel 100% normal. It's always going to have you know, good. I mean, the reconstruction is pretty traumatic. Like a lot of times you have a lot of screws, you have a lot of hardware in your knee, even if you do a graft type that doesn't have it. So I would say on your best days, you might go a few days and not remember it, but you always probably remember it, especially when you wake up in the morning, it's probably hard to, hard to get around it. Mm -hmm. For recovery yeah. time for return to sport, um, it used to be about six months would be as fast as you could possibly go. Um, our best data shows if you can delay that to about nine months, you'll do a lot better. You have a lower chance of re-injury. But even if you layer on top of that, 
your best bet is to wait at least nine months and have symmetric, at the very minimum, symmetric means as relative to your healthy side function. And so we look at quadriceps strength of that muscle in the front of your thigh that Stephen talked about. We look at mm-hmm. how far can you jump and how far can you hop should be about equal on both sides. But even when you do all of that, say you have symmetric function, you wait that long. If you're returning to high level sport, you still have a 10% chance on the good side, even up to a 25% chance if you're a high risk, especially young female athlete to get re-injured again. And so that's why we're trying to spend a lot of our time and effort to just improve the fundamental rehabilitation because it's not just the physical recovery, but it's we think it's how the brain is generating all of those movements. And we think actually when clinicians test for physical recovery, you can easily mask um, this neurological crutch. So if you use vision a lot to control your knee and the clinician just tests your strength, well, we have no idea if you're compensating with vision. And then when you're challenged in sport, you won't be able to control it anymore. And so we're hoping that when we can change therapy, we can bring down that injury rate. Well, I just wanted to thank all of you for this wonderful uh, presentation. The videos were excellent. So please tell the students, thank you so much for doing that. And so I'm going to call it a wrap. And um, I just want to remind everybody that our next Science Cafe is next week. We are not skipping a week. We will come back with Pete Harrington from Chemistry. So thank you all to uh, Dr. Grooms, Dr. Simon, and Dr. Pfeiffer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.